Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's FPV podcast. We're going to have a really good one. These two, they've already come prepared. Somebody didn't tell me I had to bring the alcohol, but they're already... Look at this. They're already up and going. We have our favorite antenna race, guy back finish, again. Race, no, don't don't race that way. Our favorite antenna guy, the genius that gives us some great high-quality FPV antennas is back, and he's going to be sharing his knowledge about long range, which he's covered extensively. We're just trying to put it into a more condensed format for our audience. But before we hear from Alex, Mr. Miyagi, say something. Hello, everybody. Go out there to that heli direct, that free shipping. Get that free shipping. That's all I can tell you. But I hope well, we everybody doing good. Yep. <laughs> we hope everybody having a great time. And uh, we got a good one, guys. Some long range questions we're gonna we're gonna get answered today for sure. Talking to the man. Talking to the man, Alex, better known as IB Crazy. Say hello. Hey everybody, and I want to if uh, Heli Direct, if you're listening, shout out, love you guys, have a good time. You know, Always. you guys are awesome. Thanks for supporting VAS. There you go. So, Alex, better known as IB Crazy, is coming back and joining us along. You know, our conversations, we're going to cover some of his products that he has out. I love some of his products. So, um, but this is more about the technicalities of actually attempting long range because we've gotten a lot of questions about it. Obviously, both Elvin and Alex have tons, like as in, you know, decades of experience with this stuff. So we're trying to impart some of that. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. Elvin may be in centuries, but we, we won't talk about that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I am working on half a century. Damn. Well, let me open let me open this by saying anybody who's listening who wants to do long range, please understand two things. One, long range is a long range goal. If if you try to fly long range straight out of the gate, you're gonna lose your aircraft and it's not coming back. You're never gonna find it. Right, uh, And that ties into the second point. It's an iterative process, which means you sequentially stress your system further and further until you feel comfortable with it um, and you know what's going to happen. You can predict it before you go for your long range mission. Um, now, granted, when you're flying long range, things happen where you cannot recover your aircraft. Uh, years ago, by the way, this is coming full circle. Uh, years ago, when I first started FPV, long range was a big thing. So it's coming back in, in, in a fashion. But guess what? There are better products now that yes. work better. But you still need to understand how they work in order to make them work for you. Um, there was a there's a, a guy by the name. His handle's Pathfinder. He was 43 miles away running a Dragon Link. I think it was a Dragon Link or maybe it was Range Link um, LRS. And a pepper box antenna on the receiver and a, a, a mad mushroom on the aircraft. He was 43 miles away out over the ocean. And between him and the airplane, a thunderstorm came in. Now, granted, it was crystal clear sky where he was. and It was crystal clear where the airplane was. But between him, there was a full thunderstorm. The humidity in the air increased such that it killed the control link. And he, he, while he was trying to hit to program his return to home mid-flight, his control link lost because it couldn't penetrate the wall of rain. And mm -hmm. he watched as his airplane dove into the ocean 43 miles away with no chance of recovery. So understand that at long range things happen and you may not be able to recover your aircraft. Now, mind you, this is a guy who got there sequentially, sequentially got a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, and he still lost his aircraft because he didn't program his return to home until it was too late. Right. Um, so I don't know which one to program on the fly. Um, I'm not, uh, it's been years since he did that, but remember that uh, long range carries a risk to it and you may lose your aircraft if you're not prepared. So preparation is the key to success. And the other key and, and how you get preparation is by stressing your system uh, in low risk situations. And I'll explain during the podcast of how to do that. Definitely. So. That's pretty cool. And I mean, just take Alex's advice, you know, with the utmost care because you're putting hundreds of dollars into the air and you don't really want to lose it. Plus, wherever it crashed, please be safe. You know, don't do it over any areas like cities. You know, don't follow some other people's advice. In this, we really want you to be safe. 
And honestly, guys, listen to the airplane guys who have done it. I know I know most people that are listening that are thinking about long range are typically quad pilots because the airplane guys, it's old hat to us. We did it years ago. We're yeah. bored with it. So um, the, a lot of the airplane guys who've done it and they've nearly lost aircraft, they've, they've really stressed their systems out. So really listen to the guys who do this with airplanes to get the advice um, – typically because they've done it for a long time. They routine and, and, and a lot of airplane guys routinely do this. They're just not posting. Right. They're right, not, right. They're not as popular. The airplane thing has has been and gone. Nobody's looking at airplanes anymore. That doesn't mean the guys are not doing it anymore. That means it's not as popular anymore. Because quads have effectively phased out airplanes and FPV. Definitely. But we were flying we were flying 30, 40 miles away before the quadcopter ever existed. Yes. So, and a quadcopter still can't go that far, right. um, it because just because of the style of flight. So, really, when you're taking long range advice, consider the source. And before accepting that advice, ask how well it applies to you. Does what they what their what advice they're giving apply to your situation? Um, I know that sounds odd, but we've got a lot of, of keyboard warriors, as I call them, who <laughs> I really wish would stop posting. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's so really remember long range is high risk and yes, n- n- it doesn't matter how many people you listen to, you still need to go out and do it progressively, progressively right. get further. I don't care if you have 10 experts you listen to and you, and they, you followed their, their advice to the letter you still are going to find new problems while you're out there at range and you need Alex, to know how to overcome. Alex, even, even, even like what Alex is saying is so true because even if like Alex is flying a system and, and I go out and buy the same system and I install it the same way Alex installed it doesn't mean that I'm going to go out and follow Alex out to the maximum distance. Right. That, 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 that if I don't test it, I won't know until I get to the point where it fails and then I'm stuck in a position of either putting it down or trying to limp back home. And usually, well, yeah. And that's, and that's the thing is can't well, the difference between letting it, having it crash and limping it back home is experience. Right. Um, long, long success in FEV part 10, long range flight. You'll watch as everything went wrong. In my aircraft. Uh, now, granted, I did not intend to shoot a video on how to do long range. If you listen very carefully to this, what we're talking about, we were going for altitude, not range. But to do altitude, you go out, then up, so you don't end up over your own head. Right. And I had every problem I could possibly fathom having, and the and I recovered the aircraft at the end of the flight. It didn't even land at my own feet. I landed at a house almost a little over half a mile away, but I had a crippled aircraft with two control surfaces. One wasn't working. So I right. lost a, I could, a, a, an elevant on a flying wing. Uh, my video was getting stomped on by my LRS control. Okay. Right. So I could barely see what I was doing. And I got into a headwind stronger than the aircraft's top speed. So even while fly aiming the nose towards me at full throttle, the airplane was actually going backwards, giving my, right. L- my giving my OSD, my on-screen display, a false reading of the direction I was going. That's so crazy. It, it, and you could hear, as I was talking to Jeremiah Gelzo, who was very inexperienced at the time, trying to figure out what was happening with the airplane. Right. And, and I did figure it out. And, and every time I figured something else out, the next problem came up. <laughs> yeah, Mind you, you're listening to a professional. I know what I'm doing, and I nearly right. lost the airplane. Fly, and I was three miles away, which isn't really long range by any right. stretch. I mean, by compared to what some people have done, it's just a lot of stuff had gone wrong, mm-hmm. and it's going to happen. So you need to be able to identify that. And I was able to identify most of those things. The only, you know, most of those things, but thankfully, because I was in a panic trying to fly the airplane, I had somebody to bounce the ideas off of going, hey, Jeremiah, go over the hill in front of us and see if you can pick up my video because I think my UHF system is stomping on my video. I can't see. He walks away from my UHF. He has video. He talks me back into good video and I continue right. flying it back home, um, you know. But during the same time, I'm in a headwind higher than the airplane's top speed. I'm going, something's wrong. My direction home arrow is flying all over the place. I'm like, it's a headwind. 
I've dealt with this. This is a headwind. This airplane isn't very fast. I'm going to go into a dive. Went into a dive. Airplane starts coming back. I try to pull out of that dive. The airplane starts to roll. I'm like, oh, crap. Something's wrong. I've lost a servo and turned out a control horn had ripped out. Um, but I want people to go through that video and study it. What went wrong and how I got mm-hmm. through it. What did that – what the problem that I had looked like. Because by seeing what's on the screen and then the dialogue mm-hmm. going back and forth, you know what's going on and yeah. how I'm getting through it. So when you – because inevitably you're going to have a similar problem. And by listening to that video or watching the video and listening to what's said, you know what to do. And you won't lose your aircraft. You know how to get through it. Now, granted, that doesn't mean go watch a video and go for long range. <laughs> but it gives you a foundation of what could happen and what could go wrong. No, that's yeah, – uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, that's – there's... <laughs> Go ahead, Elvin. There's, there's – okay, so – so I, I I I love going long range. It's it's my it's my piece. You know what I mean? That's that's my piece. You know, right. like when I when I when I I'm up and out, you know, four or five hundred feet cruising at 30, 40 miles an hour, you know, and just enjoying the air up there. You know, it, it's just the the thing that makes me feel most zen. But yeah. each time I do it, you know, like when I take off the first first flight of the day i go out probably a quarter mile then i turn around and come back yep. uh, yeah yeah turn turn around and i head back out to about a half mile and then i'll turn around and come back and then i'll keep doing that till and that's why i have so many packs so you know right. i could do this 10 times in a row until i don't work my way out to five miles you know what right I mean? it's an iterative process and what you're doing is being cautious Right. Um, you're watching what's happening on the screen and you're bringing it back before you get into too much trouble. Right. And you're going and you're asking yourself the question, Can I, when you see interference or problems, your question is, is this temporary? Can I fly through it? Right. Or is this what's telling me get the heck back because I'm not going to make it through it? Right. And, and I want you people to take that advice. Listen to what Elvin's saying. He's saying even when he, 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 he does this routinely and he still tests the limits before he goes for a long range mission. Right. You know, I haven't lost a plane yet. I've lost two, both yeah. of them in trees right over my own head. Yeah. Um, not not long range. <laughs> it's just my crossbow wasn't able to shoot the one down. The other one I didn't have the crossbow yeah. handy. But yeah. you know, it, it's an iterative process, and take your time, um, and be willing to learn along the way because you're going to get shut down at a very short, relatively short range at first, and then when you figure out what it was that shut you down. It opens up a world of possibilities to go further and keep doing mm-hmm. that. Keep learning um, as you go. If you don't go, if you don't, if you're doing long range with a closed mind, you failed. Um, keep an open mind. Try. It, it's it's a goal. It's a long range, a long range goal. It's a learning process. It's not something you just do. Long range isn't something you buy. It's not something you do. It's something you learn. Definitely. Um, it's very interesting because it's. Um, a lot of what I think of when it comes to long range and when you listen to experts is that it's not just uh, long range, here's the equipment you're needed and experience. It's also um, how far can you go in the area that you're flying because right. so much of it has to do with where your starting off point is and the path that you're taking. You know, That's going right. to really affect how far out you can go and how much your equipment will be reliable. So it's yeah, there's so much to it. So l- yeah, right. Let there's, me there's tons of it. Yeah. L- so let let's start at the very beginning. A lot of the pilots right now have a lot of equipment that's based around proximity flying, close range flying. You know, something within a football field. Let's just say mm-hmm. most right. people can do that without any issues with their current equipment. You know, most popular stuff out there right now is either Spectrum or FR Sky, Free Sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you have that type of equipment and just a regular old airplane, hopefully a full spectrum uh, receiver, Alex, what like what can they start doing with that equipment, and what should they start thinking about to start, you know, uh, extending their range reliably? You know, what? Well, if this were the airplane world, I'd tell them go back to seventy-two megahertz or even fifty megahertz. But yeah, and Elvis <laughs> That's has not hands there. He he's watched <laughs> me run seventy-two megahertz long range. I, and I, I still have my system. I still <laughs> run 72. My last airplane, I put 72 megahertz in. 
I just right. got another crystal for my Electron 6. Oh, yeah, man. Old as gold. I mean, old right. equipment old does go gold. further than new equipment uh, right. in general. Um, but there is there are long-range systems. Dragon Link, Crossfire, uh, Easy UHF. Those are the three most popular for Control Link. Um, but before you start getting into that, the first thing to do is to punish your video link. Um, so, and the way you punish your video link is run low power. Whether back to, if you have a selectable power video transmitter, go down to the lowest power setting. If you don't um, have a selectable power, buy a 25 milliwatt or buy an attenuator. 6 dB cuts your, every 6 dB cuts your range effectively in half. So if you have 12 dB attenuator, you're going to see the, the, the problems you would see at 25% of the distance. So right. if you're going for four miles, you put a 12 dB attenuator, you go fly out to a mile. What problems you have at a mile with that attenuator on are similar to what you're going to see at four miles without. True. So attenuators, huge learning tool, highly recommend them. They're inexpensive. They're you know, seven or eight dollars, maybe yeah. 12 for a really good one. Yeah. Um, play with attenuators. Then the next thing you need to know is that you know, your spectrum radio isn't going to take you there. Your free sky radio isn't going to take you there. Are there right. people that boost them illegally? Yes, there are, but they are not designed for that. And right. boosting is typically a really terrible way to get around the problem because part wasn't specified for it. So what you want to get plus into you, is it. Plus you create issues for the rest of us that are not, that are in the vicinity of you too. There's so a reason no. boosting it is illegal. All right. That is basically what it comes down to. And and boosting it, you're stressing. A booster is not designed. It's designed for Wi-Fi with a 10% duty cycle. Right. So it's, I equate it to running your car with no coolant to it. If you run your car for three or four minutes and then let it cool down for an hour without any coolant in it, it'll probably be okay. Right. But if you run it 100% of the time, you know, constantly driving without any coolant on it, it's going to burn up. And that's exactly what you're doing with these boosters. So stop trying to push equipment that's never designed for it. And getting equipment that's designed for it on the control yeah. side. So, um, like I said, Crossfire, Dragon Link, Easy UHF, these are the popular ones. I personally use um, Open LRS, uh, the Flytron. Uh, it, it's it, now granted, it has more issues. It's a do it yourselfer type. Mm -hmm. But um, if I had to recommend one right now, I'd recommend Crossfire. That'd be my highest recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, with a, with a, uh, a careful nod to, to Dragon Link, as much as I've had problems in the past with Dragon Link, they've been pretty good about fixing them. So at this point, I, I can't say I'd recommend them, but I can say that there's a lot of success with them. So I don't have a whole lot of experience with the new Dragon Link system, but there are a lot of people out there that are. So, you know, it seems to be a pretty good bet. Uh, Easy UHF um, has been pretty solid. Um, those are your three big systems out there that, that can get your control where you need to go. Now, that doesn't mean you bury your antenna inside the quad frame. Uh, stick right. it, get it clear. Again, when I when I talk about long range and that kind of stuff, you've got to get your antennas away from that carbon fiber frame. Um, that's going to destroy it. The other thing is the ground. I did a video not too long ago about the effects of ground on the antenna. So the ground station antenna, because you are near the physical ground, mm -hmm. your antenna is using the ground as part of its signal. You're right. literally inducing currents in the ground you're standing on. Now, if you're on sand versus gravel versus clay versus black dirt, that all changes things. Um, and I did a video showing why the 5 dBi mod on the Tyrannus doesn't work, but the folded uh, microwave antenna that I came up with does work because it mitigates that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what you want to look for. Now, granted, those antennas are not available for anything but 2.4 yet. Trappy is literally finishing up the microwave loop antenna for the Crossfire. Nice. I showed them the instructions. People, I, I took six people that swore they would never use Crossfire again because they had problems with it at long range. And I gave him this microwave loop antenna and said, hey, did this fix your control problems? You know, are you willing to still use Crossfire? And they went from, I'll never use it again, to firm believers in it. That is the importance of antennas. Antennas are very important. But yeah. unlike, unlike the video system where the receiver antenna is more important, in the control, the transmitter antenna is more important. Yes. The most important antenna is the one nearest the ground because the ground affects the signal. 
So you want a closed loop antenna of some sort. That means no open loop dipoles, no monopoles, none of that crap, none of those open whips. Um, if you're truing, truly going for long range, you want something that is a, a solid loop. You know, it, it, it goes all the way around. Um, those are more resilient to the ground. I see Elvin's got a Moxon rectangle. Believe it or not, while that works, the only reason it works is because it's mounted in your hands. Um, I am actually moving away from that in favor of the folded loop or the microwave loop because it's actually more stable. The Moxon uh, literally manipulates the ground currents to yeah. your advantage, but there yeah. are certain places where it fails. So yeah. I'm moving to the microwave loop because it's just a little bit more stable and a little bit more reliable, but the Moxon still works. Um, so remember the antenna on the ground station, whether it's your control in your hand or the video on the ground station is your most important antenna. Um, on the video, obviously you're going to want ser seriously, you're going to want higher gain. Right. That does not mean you want the 24 dB grid antenna. <laughs> remember that high gain is a narrower beam. Okay, you have a certain volume of air you can fly within, you can manipulate it however you want, but you can't make it bigger. So what you're doing with the ground station antenna on the video is manipulating that signal and how our, and how it's received. So you want an antenna that shoots out a beam that you can fly within, but still has the range you want. And the way you do this um, is you pick landmarks along the way and you right. fly to those landmarks. Now, mind you, because you know where they are, you've already aimed your ground, ground station antenna at those landmarks. Because when you start drifting out of the beam, your signal's gonna get weak. And trust me, it's not easy to follow a straight line. A lot of people think it's easy. Well, guess what? Those are the people who haven't tried to fly four right. or five miles in a straight line. It just doesn't happen. So what you wanna do is pick out objects in, you know, Look at Google Maps to great reference. Just yep. pick up things that are easily seen from the air that are in a, they don't have to be a perfectly straight line, but reasonably straight line within the beam of the antenna. You know, 20 degrees is fine. Um, and you're going to follow that path and don't deviate from it. Otherwise, you're going to get lost and you could fly out of the beam of your, your antenna on your video system. Um, so between that, you know, use a, a connected folded antenna on the ground. Um, a, a true long range system that's designed to actually go the distance you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then planning your flight. And that's the big thing. Plan the flight, um, pick out landmarks, fly to those landmarks. And like Elvin said, turn around and come back. All right. And then go out further, go to the next landmark, turn around and come back and fly to the next landmark. All right. Yep. It's iterative process. Get there point by point, take your time. Don't jump into it. I mean, don't, Trust me, there are tons of people who've lost aircraft who just tried to do it. <laughs> and there's there, there are other people who have just jumped into it and have done it. And we have a word for those people. Lucky. All right. <laughs> All right. The people that make long range for the first try are really, really lucky. You're probably not going to be one of those. Kind of like buying a lottery ticket. The chances of you winning on that first lottery ticket aren't very good. Right. If you do, we have a name for you, too. Lucky. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't take that. Don't take that kind of risk. Get there incrementally. Yeah. Get the right equipment. Learn how to use it. And here's the key. When I say learn how to use it, I mean learn how it works. Um, the more you understand how something works, when you have a problem. I didn't say if. I said when because everybody's going to face this when they fly wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. When you have a problem, you know what to do, or you'll be able to figure out what to do before you've lost communication with your aircraft. Um. Again, this is all coming back to that long range video, a success in PV part 10. That, gosh, it must have been shot five years ago. Um, yeah. You know, just watch it and watch all the problems that can come up. And that's only maybe 25 percent of the things that could go wrong. But honestly, those were all game. Those were all deal breakers for most people. Right. Yeah. I had four problems in that video, serious problems in that video that most people would have crashed their aircraft had they, you know, but knowing how that system works. You can recover it the way I did. So I want you to watch that because I failed. I didn't make long range. I failed, but I got the airplane back before I got too far. Um, so again, get there sequentially. Take it easy. Don't lose the aircraft. The other thing is record your flight. If you get out at distance and something goes wrong, you don't quite know what it is. 
bring the aircraft back, make sure you have a recording of your DVR, then post it up and tag some people saying, I attempted long range and this is what I saw. Let those long range experience people tell you what they saw. Because chances are they've seen the same thing and they can tell you, hey, check this part of your system, check this, check that. Um, that's going to be really, really valuable to have that DVR and then get feedback from other pilots that have done it. Um, look, nobody's an expert overnight. You get there sequentially. Uh, you know, go, with, go into this with a little bit of humility and um, have some support from ex some experienced people. Mm. And um, if you're getting conflicting advice, um, ask yourself this, okay, who's, who seems to have more experience with this? <laughs> Honestly, who, who seems to be more, I don't care who seems to, who has a, who says I'm a professional. I work with the U S military and I, I'm part of, uh, you know, right. North Grumman. Guess what? I don't trust that one second. But if somebody says, comes to me and says, you know, I've been sequential. I've been doing long range forever here. My long range rigs. Here's the equipment I've used. And here's where I haven't made my long range goals. I failed because of this component failed me. I failed because I forgot to take into account that, hey, I'm 200 feet above the ground, seven miles out. The trees right. 600 feet away are blocking my signal. The right. people who tell you the problems they've had, that's the one I've trusted. And that's the other side of it is at long range, you need altitude to clear objects. Right. Uh, classic call. I got this from Chris Click of Right Wing three years ago, four years ago, something like that. This is before he really got into FPV. He was just getting into FPV. And yeah. he's stressing he's stressing his system out to see how far he can go. He lives in Arizona, which is flat as a board, right. out over the desert. Primo country. And he calls me and he says, Alex, I lost my airplane. And I said, okay. And he calls me knowing full well that I've, I've flown long range. And he wants to know what happened to his airplane. And I said, what happened? He said, I was out about 10 miles. I got interference and I hit return to home and the airplane never came back. And I said, you test return to home? He said, yeah, I tested it at five miles and the plane came back and it was circling over my own head. And I said, so you went on about 10 and it's gone. It didn't work. I said, do you have enough battery? He said, yeah, I had plenty of battery. I said, okay, so the return to home system works. Check. Um, you tested it at moderate range. Check. But it didn't work at, at range. And I said, okay, so I said, so Chris, can you tell me what you saw before you hit return to home and what you saw when you hit the switch? And he said, it was just open desert. There's nothing there. I said, nothing. He said, nothing at all. There's nothing but dirt and grass. And I said, so what do you see? He said, when I hit return to home, I saw the plane start to turn. And and I interrupted him. I said, did it dive? Did it drop altitude or did it climb? He said, it, it seemed to drop a little bit. I said, okay. So when it drops is when you lost video. I said, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So in my mind, I'm going, okay, he flew behind an object. Granted, he's 400 right. feet up, but he's 10 miles out. A right. tree, I, I want to say a tree, like a bush 300 feet away from you will block a signal 10 miles out when you're right. that low. And he said it turned. It, he said he knew he started, it made the turn or it started to turn around. So it was coming back, but it never came mm -hmm. back. And so all I'm thinking of, this flew into the side of a hill. It, 400 feet isn't much of a hill. And so I, right. I said, so are there any hills? He's like, no, it's dead flat. And I said, so what is out there? It, the plane hit something. I promise you it hit something. Mm -hmm. And he's like, there's nothing. I'm like, how about a transmission tower? Is there, are there high tension wires? Is there a cell phone tower? He goes, oh, yeah, there's high voltage towers. I said, go find the high, high voltage tower. That's where your plane is. Guess where the plane was? <laughs> Stuck at the tower. <laughs> at the base of the hot transmission tower. That's it, literally it where the it. plane was. Again, to him, it didn't matter. What it did is it turned around and because there's no pilot there. It flew right into the damn high tension tower. Right. He didn't know. Wow. He did everything right. So he, he did recover his plane. Got there. Right. But what did he do? He consulted an expert who had done this before. Right. Okay. Even though he got there iteratively, he went sh like two miles and three, then four, then five. Mm -hmm. When he had a problem, he didn't know the way to fix that problem was to punch the throttle and climb. He knew that his return to home worked. So he hit return to home, not realizing the transmission towers are right. pretty freaking tall. Right. And that's when the plane turned around and hit. 
So some place, some places at 200 feet off the ground, right? Right. And, and, and that's the thing is you got a little, little hill. It doesn't even take much. Boom. It turned around. That's what it hit. It's not that he did everything right and still didn't, and, and still he had a problem. So mm-hmm. it happens. The only way he recovered his airplane is he knew where that transmission tower was. And he remembered because he DVR'd it. Mm-hmm. He was able to go back to that DVR and go, where the heck was that transmission tower? Look at the DVR footage. Said that's where it is. Drove to it. That's where the airplane was. Wow, that's amazing. So, right, amazing. He did though. everything right. It could have lost his airplane had he not hit the record button. All right. So, now, like at ten miles up, four hundred feet up. I mean, f- to a lot of people that don't deal with long range a lot, that seems like a lot of height. But ten miles nothing. out, that's really nothing, nothing at that point. It's nothing. And, that's like one point two degree azimuth or something stupid like that. Yeah. And it's nothing. I mean, that's like being okay. Let me give you an idea. That's like being if you want to you want to go backwards with it. You divide by ten. All right. That's one mile out, forty feet up. All right. Forty feet that, up. That's, yeah. That wow. One that's, mile away, dude, and we can cut it in half again, or we can, we can cut it in half now. That means half a mile out, twenty feet up. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That means that's, at half a mile, you can't clear a house. Right. You cannot clear a one-story house half a mile away from yourself. Right. Now that's something it's it blows my mind when I hear that because people don't calculate that when they're first looking at this stuff. It's like it's four hundred feet up. It's like really high up. Well, t- four hundred no. feet. You know, everybody knows about the FAA. When you start seeing yeah. pixelization in snow, it probably means something's blocking it. Punch right. the throttle, climb. That's the first thing you do when you see snow. Hit your throttle, pull back, climb up. If the snow continues turn around if the snow goes away you know you've got a signal blockage and you just cleared it so yeah so the thing is is punch the throttle and climb and see if you can get away from it if it goes away use as a learning tool something blocked the signal when you come back and land look at a map look at the horizon figure out what blocked that signal yeah it's a learning remember it's a learning experience this is something long range is something you learn not something you do. So let's right. talk a little bit about interference because I think a lot of people, when, you know, when Elvin says it's very tiring after a long range mission, um, one of the reasons why I think people say it, and I just want to confirm this with you two, is that you really have to pay attention to what's going on because what you're looking for as you go out is like um, consistent or something you can identify as interference. Right. Because yep. Yeah. And like, you know, a lot of us get a little lazy and, you know, we don't we don't pick up on the, the, the minute stuff. But in long range, that's the first hint that you're going to run into a problem and <laughs> right, you need yeah. to pay attention. And so right. that's that. So like going out five miles, you have to pay attention the entire five miles. It's not like time. I can. Yeah. So, yeah, this is this is not something you go and go and turn your brain off the whole time. You're analyzing your video. Exactly. You're not. And you're analyzing your control, too. You're testing your control. One of the things I like to do, Jason Johnson, Sentry, FPV Lab, had a really good way to do this. I loved it. What he would do is he'd take his antenna out of polarization while he's flying, okay? Which means he'd point the null of his antenna right at his aircraft, and he'd put it down low near the ground because the ground's going to destroy that video feed. Mm -hmm. And he'd wait for the aircraft to lose control. Or he'd wait for his RSSI, relative signal strength, which he had on his screen to go down. Why? Because he had a way to fix it. Take the antenna, point the strong, you know, point the long side of the antenna at the aircraft, not the null. All of a sudden, your signal strength increases. Pull it up off the ground, up in the air, boom, signal strength increase. He's Mm -hmm. inducing a failure before it's forced on him. He's waiting. He's going out there, harming his link deliberately to see how far he can get. So he's always got extra margin in the tank. Right. Just to give you an idea, I've been in an aircraft that crash landed. My dad was flying. Okay. We blew the motor. We were flying along through the mountains of Pennsylvania. The mountains are laden with trees. Next thing you know, the airplane starts shaking violently. I mean, really violently. And then all goes silent as we see a single propeller blade in our windshield. Whoa. The engine threw a rod. Wow. All right. Now, why am I alive? 
because my dad had enough altitude to go for distance. And he right. went flying, through, gliding through the mountains with no motor, looking for a place to land. He had lots of time. He built in error margin. He had built something into the flight in case something happened that he could land the airplane. Mm-hmm. Now, we landed it and he landed at a field of alfalfa. And we took off, and, and and the engine was rebuilt in place. And a couple of weeks later, they, they they flew. They literally took off from the interstate. Um, but had he not had that extra error margin, we'd have ended up in the trees. So this is what you do with your video, with your trans, your control. Put it near the ground, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and when you lose control, raise it up away from the ground. Um, yep. That kind of thing. It's it and that, again. That comes to understanding the equipment. Try to cause a failure before it happens. Mm-hmm. Another good way to do it: put your hand in front of your video antenna. Mm-hmm. This sounds like something you shouldn't do, but this tells you how much margin you have left. If you put your if you put your hand in front of the video antenna, the video completely goes out. That Turn tells around. you you're, you're getting near <laughs> the end of your range. But if it just gets weak and you still see a ghost or a shadow or you can still mm-hmm. kind of make out what you're doing, you're probably okay. Right. Um, and so that's the thing is just do things to tr- deliberately wreck your signal. Because if you're at the long range, what happens if somebody walks in front of your antenna? Hey, man, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> that's this happened, happened to me. To me twice. Okay. <laughs> hey, man, get you pull your goggles off and go, hey, get out of the way of my receiver. I can't see. You know? <laughs> Things like that happen. All right. So it's always good to have a spotter, not to watch where you're going, but to make sure nobody's bugging you while you're trying to fly. You know, somebody who can point your antenna, somebody you can who you can bounce ideas off of if something goes wrong. You know, just somebody to help you troubleshoot right. because you're trying to fly. So have a spotter. So really what it is is And when you're coming back, you know. Yeah, right. It's an iterative yeah. process. Remember, get there sequentially. Have a spotter to bounce ideas off of and to clear the airspace for you. Mm-hmm. Try to wreck your signal at close range so you know it'll hold on at long range. All right. Have equipment designed to get you where you're trying to go and pick out landmarks so you know where you are. Those right. are the biggest five pieces of advice I can give. That's 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 it, folks, right there. That's your five your five great chances to compete yeah. and, and finish. The uh, right equipment long, is actually one mission. of the least important things, but it's plan your flight as in pick out landmarks. That's the most important thing. Right. Okay. That is absolutely by far the most important. Two, second most important, wreck your own signal. Try to cause a problem at close range before you get at long range. Third equipment. most important is your equipment. Okay, choose equipment that's designed and st- and robust enough to get you there. Fourth, have a spotter, somebody to bounce ideas off with and field comments if somebody walks up to you or there's air traffic in the way. Mm-hmm. Okay, that kind of stuff. Those are the four most important things you can do. And the last is have experience to go do it iteratively go make it iteratively Mm -hmm. go out come back go out come back iteratively get there those five pieces of advice are what can are what are going to make you successful if you go as a lone wolf that airplane or or quadcopter isn't coming back it's gone okay um it's absolutely gone and i can tell you this because i've been on a few missions with some people that I can't tell you who they are, where had they not had me piggybacking along, knowing what's going on, their aircraft would have never come back. And yes, these are people who should have known better. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, just have that, that. I was just there as an observer, making sure nothing went wrong. And of course, when things went wrong, I went, okay, engage like they're trying to fly right and i'm going Mm -hmm. okay this thing's going down where how are we going to recover it are we safe are we clear of obstacles is this are we going to be able to recover how far away are we where are we you know what's going on they're trying to fly they're in panic mode i'm going okay where what's got (laughs) that's a spotter's good for definitely it's like i said this is not easy i wish it was easy but it's not easy no hey that's part of the that's part of the allure, right? If it was easy, yeah. 
people would everybody be doing did. it. Exactly. Well, it's not that everybody would be doing it. I think the challenge, and it's it's a never-ending challenge, right? You could always push yourself a little bit. You don't have to measure in like quarter miles. You can measure in feet. And every single yeah, right. time you break your own record, it's kind of like a it's a new that's excitement. That's the iterative process, right? Yeah. So you to break your own record. Don't. Yeah, that's the other thing. Don't compare yourself to others. Everybody else right. is a different environment. If you're trying to compare yourself to, say, Trappy, you're not going to do it. He lived, <laughs> he, he lived, but he did those flights in this in, in the Austrian in the Austrian mountains where there's nothing. He's on the mountaintop, right. looking over this long valley. All right, talking about the 80, ideal 80 situation. Eighty mile valley, eighty mile valley. He did eighty three, I think, was his record. Okay. And he and it was a one way flight, and he had a car chasing it the whole way. He went across a, a country border doing that flight. All right, Trappy knows what he was doing. He set his flight up for success, and he just went. All right, just to see that he could do it. Don't compare yourself to that dude. All right, compare yourself to you. Are right. you better than the last time? And if not, what did right. you do wrong? When you identify what you're what you did wrong, then you now you are better than the last time. Exactly. It's it's true. You know. So don't don't please don't compare yourself to, to others. Just compare yourself to yourself. Yeah, just get it's, inspiration it's from badges. others. Yeah, yeah right. It's, it's your badge. Not, it's your not badge. Traffic's badge. Exactly. That's that's how I look at it. You know, like I, I so far I, I've I haven't cracked five miles, but I've done distance three miles so many times that I'm so comfortable. You know what I mean? I take right. off and I just it's a relaxing flight. Um, and but five I, and I is. Is it? <laughs> no, no. Five, five, <laughs> is sure, a is. five is a stretcher. So it's not, it's not comfortable for me either. And I know I know a couple of guys that that have gone three and four and just can't make it past number five. You know, and just no matter what they try, they've tried different radio systems, different video links, you know, all that, and they still have not been able to complete that. So it it, it is what I explain it like this. Right. Okay. First of all, it's called noise floor. Yes. All right. It's called the Fresnel zone. If there's if there's interference on your channel, you're not making it. Okay. Right. There's nothing you can do. The best equipment in the world is not going to overcome a noise floor. Right. Fresnel zone. Something could be blocking it. Like you're not high enough for distance out, or you're too high and the signal just doesn't get there. All right. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. And anybody that can't that says, "Man, I only made four miles," and turns around and goes, well, "I don't feel successful," I tell them this: Go walk four miles <laughs> right now. Turn around and walk back, and then call me as soon as you get back. That's a long, daggone way. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's it a is long very true. Flight, it is a right? long flight, and it's always it's a long way. Right. It's an I don't know. Were you guys right open? Uh wow. yeah. I was. You're at the riot open. Okay. Do you remember my how I trolled the entire event? Okay. How? No, you didn't tell me this one. Okay, go. Oh, you weren't on the radio. I was not on the radio. Okay. So there was a badge that if you flew at every each track you flew at, you got a check off of this badge, and at the end of the day, you turned it in for a for a prize or whatever, a drawing or something. And I said, well, now mind you, this field was like two and a half miles long like they've got eight tracks going on at once i'm going i can do this from one spot oh okay i heard this story. <laughs> go so yeah so i'm going i can do this from one spot two and a half miles or flat ground is nothing you know um now granted i was on 3.3 gigahertz again mm -hmm. most people don't know that band even exists right uh, i also had 2.3 gigahertz in the backup i was using an open lrs with a telemetry that tells me when my signal's getting weak and I flew my airplane over every single track from the wing track in the backfield. The whole time, everybody in the wing tent is laughing because as soon as that wing appeared over the track, you've got guys blowing up the radio going, oh, my God, get that wing out of here. He's going to interfere with us. He's going to cause us to crash. Somebody crash that wing. Somebody hit that wing with their air, their quad. Some, do something about them. Not realizing I'm flying a completely different band because it's not showing up on anybody's goggles. Nobody's monitor. But their inexperience tells them that I'm going to interfere with them. And obviously, I'm not. I'm running 25 right. milliwatts, like the rules state, but I'm on a completely different band that nobody at that event has. 
I'm also running a UHF radio, which nobody is nobody at that event really had experience with. So the guys in the tent are going, this is IB crazy. He knows what he's doing. You know, it's an airplane, for goodness sake. Right. And the radio is blowing up. Every time I flew over a track, the radio, get that plane out of here. It was hysterical. I had everybody but the battle track in a panic. The reason the battle track wasn't in a panic, even though I did fly over them at last, it was because we had worked out RF problems between each other all day long. And mm-hmm. they see an airplane, they go, oh, yeah, it's one of those guys. We're good. We already worked out our problems with them. You know, um, again, it's two and a half miles to most people. They're, your quad, most people that are flying mini quads can't get that, can't get that far and come back. Remember, if you can go out, if your quad is capable of two and a half miles, your your maximum distance is, if you're, let's say your quad's capable of a five-mile trip. Right. The maximum distance you want to go out is two miles because you got to go two miles out, two miles back, and have enough in the tank just in case you have a, a battery issue, it sags, you have headwind, whatever. Right. Five-mile quad, two-mile range maximum. Okay? That's um, – now, granted, I was flying a very efficient wing with a with a 45-minute flight time. Two and a half miles is nothing. And, and if I did drop it, I knew where I was. I had landmarks. I had a gosh darn map. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew where that thing was going in. <laughs> the and tracks are your out, landmarks, yeah. It turns out I actually had a bad cell in the battery, and I barely made it back. The battery voltage started sinking because I had a bad cell in the battery, mm-hmm. and I was able to identify it. I'm like, mm, the plane isn't performing quite right. And so I brought it back. I was going to go back and hit all the fields again. I went, nah, something's not right. I brought it back and the airplane literally battered. That one cell was completely flat when the airplane landed at my feet. Wow. So yeah. losing a cell is bad. Yeah, right. That's the other side. It you happens though. You have a good battery. So before, like just because you have a bunch of batteries doesn't mean one of them's not going to die on you. Right. Um, so anything can go wrong. Um, and, and like I said, I, I will never forget that because I can't, I'll never forget the radio lighting up, you know, with panic and all the things they were thinking about doing to get the airplane out of the air that was flying over their track. And the wing guys are laughing because they realize exactly what I'm doing. And the whole purpose mm-hmm. is I'm getting that stamp on my badge that I've mm-hmm. flown at these tracks because I did go through the gates like two miles away. You know, I, I did fly at your track. I just wasn't part of your, your racing event. I was way the heck back at the other end. Wow. Um, and this is, this is experience. I've done that a lot, but I was in a, would I have done that over terrain? I didn't know. Not a snowball's chance in hell. I knew where I was the whole time. If that plane goes down, I'm over an open field where there are people who watched it go in. Mm-hmm. And I know where that field is. I can drive down to the other side of the AMA field and say, hey, anybody see a bright orange airplane? <laughs> That's mine. Can I go get it? You know, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. I can identify it. So even though I would not have done that had I not known the area. So um, that's the other side is. The only reason I did that is I, I knew where it would be. So uh, I, I hope people understand that being a professional doesn't mean you can do anything. Being a professional knows when means you know when to call it quits. You mm-hmm. know when you know, that's the difference. A pro isn't successful every time. A pro knows I'm about to get in over my head. Let's get that right. back. Yeah. Definitely. That's, that's a I, I've had enough. <laughs> yep. Yep. And this is not going to work out. I'm turning around. Right. Okay. Yeah. So like, look, don't, don't let failure stop you. <laughs> failure, failure is how you learn. Mm-hmm. If you haven't made your goal, that just means you have more to learn. That doesn't mean you fail, right. you know, because honestly, there have been many range flights that I've done where I'm like, Nope, I'm bailing out. I'm turning around and coming back. And this is a guy who designs RF equipment for a living. That's true. Right. Look at that treasure I'm, trove I'm behind not him. making this. I'm not making it this time. I got to turn around. That's all I can do. Right. Cool. Yeah. People. People don't get that with me. Like, I. I. I hey, uh, I'm having problems. I'm coming back. What? Oh, we just got here. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know when to, that. That's what being an expert is. Knowing when. Knowing when it's time to turn around. Definitely. Right. And that's Definitely. just it. Is. It's not making it every time. Making it look easy. It's knowing that. I'm about to I'm about to be in over my head. Let's turn around. Definitely. Right, so. 
Yeah, and don't take that as failure. That's not failure. That's learning. All right. Cool. Failure is when you give up. When you say no, I I I'm done learning. I'm I'm not going to ask any questions. I'm done. That's failure. That is you failure. Know? And you know, you'll never get anywhere in this sport if you're going to do that. Yeah, right. I mean, there might be a point where you say, look, uh, my noise floor, you've identified the problem. Hey, my noise floor is too high. I, I just can't overcome this noise floor. Well, then All you right. change locations. You go right. fly from another area. <laughs> what do you go for? You know, wind farms are great for that, by the way. I, long range wind farms are awesome. Um, yes. Low RF noise. There's nothing there. You know, um, we have some I, great ones out here. Yeah, I mean, I drove home from my parents' house a couple of times and deliberately went like through um, between my parents' house and here. There are some wind farms. I like, I feel like doing a long range flight. And I know the noise floor is low. Break out my spectrum analyzer, scan the noise floor. Like, yep, my band is clear and go fly. Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, and that's a great tool too, is a spectrum analyzer. I mean, if you're yes. a spectrum analyzer, you, you aim it in your general direction, turn it to your frequency. You don't see anything. Well, unless you're getting hit by burst transmission, which happens. Um, you're good. Occasionally, you will get a burst transmission. So if you're interfering with somebody else's signal and they have scalable power, which is common, to get that system through, they might ramp the power through the roof to blast over your signal, which means you lost control mm -hmm. until they get done transmitting. Usually those are four to five seconds long and you go, oh, my God, what happened? And then you regain control. It's like, I just got slammed by burst transmission. Whoo, brown pants <laughs> You know, I almost crashed into my own high school because of a burst transmission. <laughs> I'm wow. watching my airplane spiral right down towards the room and go, come on. I'm, I'm in my radio go, beep, meaning signal lost, signal lost. It didn't chirp. It didn't make a sound all day. And suddenly, beep, I'm going, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I was maybe 50 feet. I was like four or 500 feet up when it hit me. And I was maybe 50 feet up when this radio suddenly went silent. The airplane recovered. The dive went, whoo, <laughs> you know, it happens. You know, it happens. It does happen. Now, uh, l let me take a few seconds to actually, because we talked about uh, the transmitter and uh, the, the common brands that we like using them. Let's talk a little bit about video, like each the the popular brands. Uh and what you think about the milliwatts for each band and the antennas that go with it. Obviously, the most popular one is 5.8 for uh, right now video guys. And like, like take, for example, the TBS like high voltage. I think you can ramp up to 800 milliwatts. I think it's yeah, either it's six or. Yeah, okay. It's, it's 600, eight, 800. It's eight. Eight, eight. At 600 or 800, what would your recommended range be and what antenna would you put on your aircraft? Well, let me explain this. Would you pull a trailer with a motor scooter? No. Okay. Then don't try to fly long range with 5.8 gigahertz. You're literally making your life hard. All right. The, lo the lower your frequency, the longer the wavelength, the less propagation loss you have. Right. Honestly, I fly long range at 2.3 gigahertz. All right. It's a very rare band um, that very few people have and very few people use. It's got a moderately long wavelength. I use 433 or 915 for control. Mm. One three is also a great band for long range, but literally flying five eight for long range, you are shooting yourself in the foot. All right. You're, you're, you're making your life difficult. 5.8 gigahertz degrades very quickly over distance. Can you do long range at five eight? Yes. But compare the long range record at 5.8 gigahertz which is, I think right now, like 8.5 miles to the long range record at, at 1.3 gigahertz. Okay. At 80, 83 miles. All right? right. That's not the end user. That's literally the signal just run, but it works better. Right. So can you turn 5.8 gigahertz up to the point where it makes those ranges? Sure. You could absolutely put a, find some five watt transmitter and throw it on. <laughs> but here's the yep. problem. You've got to communicate control, and if your video transmitter is screaming so loud that the receiver can't hear control, I don't care if you can see. You can't control, you can't fly. All right. So you really want to make up make up the distance on the receiver, um, on the receiver antenna. High gain on the receiver antenna is really the way to go. Now, six or eight hundred milliwatts. I tell people, look, start at two hundred. See how far you can go. And then when you go up to 800 milliwatts, you can double your range. 
That sounds different. You're quadrupling your power to get double the range. Huh, okay. So going from 200 milliwatts to 800 milliwatts is going to double your range. So right. start at 200. Better yet, start at 25. Go to 200, your range just quadrupled. From 25 to 200, your range just quadrupled. And then go from 200 to 800, your range just doubled from there. Oh, nice. And then and then once you hit the wall there, take the 5.8 gear out of the aircraft mm-hmm. and put it 2.3, 3.3, 1.3, you know, a lower wavelength and go for it again. Okay. Um, again, 2.4 control and 1.3 video don't play well together without a notch filter. There mm-hmm. goes the experience knowing what happens. I make a very, very cheap notch filter that goes on the 1.3 gigahertz control to keep from knock or video transmitter to keep from knocking out the one point or the 2.4 gigahertz control. But right. as we stated earlier, 2.4 is not a good control band for long range. So you probably right. ought to be running a 910, uh, you know, Crossfire or 433 Dragon Link, Easy UHF, Oven, LRS, those guys. Range Link, another good one, R Link. Um, so. There is where research, you can't just buy this equipment. You have to research what is compatible now. It just doesn't work. It doesn't just plug in and work anymore. It has to be compatible. Okay. So. Hey, Elvin, what are you doing for your three-mile trips? Are you using 5.8 or are you using one of the lower bands? Uh, I, I run 1.3 for uh, video on three point three miles. Anything within a mile, I run 5.8. And I run uh, the oh ET- the open LRS ETS See, Jeff. He, you're the you're the you're the reason why I bought this in the first place. <laughs> Are, you back down the power level to level five. Yes, I'm down to level five. Yes, the sir. reason why you don't run that at level seven is they tend to burn themselves up. So you actually back down the power to gain reliability. That's still like 400 milliwatts, which is enough to get you there. Right. So, uh, yeah, and and I, I do you use the telemetry beep. Yeah, I, I I don't like that damn beeper, man. That <laughs> well, you, you've thing. learned you've learned to trust the system. That's a little different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like right now, I got I got the uh, the iNav. I'm running the iNav in uh, Mini Drag, and uh, I'm I've been watching that, and I I'm I'm getting good signal out at a mile. So at uh, five point eight, it's fine, but. I'm waiting for my other system to come back from Mike and uh, and uh, push it push it a little further. So I I plan on cracking my 10, 10 miles this year before the end of the what year. What I want you to do is remember if you have a problem, back away, back your transmitter, your control transmitter away from your ground station. Run long AV cables. Like yes. if you have a problem, you know, sit there and circle and back physically move your body and your control transmitter away from your ground station. If it goes away, you know that's an LRS barking in the ear of your receiver. I, and I the have... same thing on board the aircraft. Your video transmitter can knock out your control. Mm-hmm. You know, the only difference is you can change the separation on the ground if you have long enough AV cables. On the aircraft, you're wing to wing, and that's about as far as you get. Hint, hint. Put one on one wing, one on the other. <laughs> For all I, you guys. I, I'm there. I'm there. I'm there. I know what I, I'm talking about. I've been paying. I, you know, look, I, 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 I'm, I've been a fan of watching you and Trappy and um, a couple of other guys, Painless and uh, Hoss. You want to talk about real superstars? Talk about Gabriel. That guy's oh, still yeah. 72 megahertz through Brazil. I think it was Brazil. Holy yeah. smokes! Look at the crap he's doing. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. some serious cojones. He he's he's one of those pilots that uh, yeah. just pushes the limit and does it well. You know he's yeah. he's he's not a he's not a showboat either. You know what I mean? It's, oh, Gabriel he, is. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> so crappy. Uh, uh, they're not showboats. They're they're professionals. Same difference. <laughs> uh, I, I, I agree with Alex's uh, assessment. Uh, anyways, hey, 3.3. I know you did a video on 3.3. I think you gave it a, a an above average rating. Has no, the I didn't. has I gave it a piss poor rating? Oh, you gave a piss poor rating. Okay, has it gotten any better since you're actually using yeah, 3.3? What? In fact, I really need to release a new video because that video is now out of date. The problem was is I was able to get one mile maximum out of the 200 milliwatt 3.3 gigahertz system. And what had happened is there was a capacitor on the board that was hard soldered right next to the SMA that the instant it saw any stress, it broke, which backed my power from 200 milliwatts down to four milliwatts. 
Oh, so wow. yeah, I'm running four milliwatts and I'm doing a mile on this system. And then uh, Hobby Wireless, who it's the same owner of Hobby Wireless and Electrify RC, it's the Electrify RC Finch. He identified the problem when I sent the transmitters back that that that, that the capacitor that was supposed to be there had broken off the board. Um, and so he fixed that by attaching in a uh, cable extension directly to the board that was flexible so it wouldn't stress the board out and uh now i am slowly switching my new rigs over to 3.3 because now the problem is fixed but previously i said the only reason to run 3.3 gigahertz is because your friends are running 5.8 gigahertz and you're sick of getting your video stopped um, because it just wasn't very reliable, but, um, Electrify RC, Hobby Wireless, um, went back and agreed that they had a problem and they went and fixed it. And this is the difference between, uh, I see this in a lot of, um, I don't see this in a lot of companies where they go, okay, I understand we have a problem. Let's fix this. A lot of them bury it under the rug spectrum. <laughs> uh, Ouch. I just had to say that. Um, I just had to say that because I've had lots of problems with them. Um, and they've swept, I've, I've addressed their problems, told them how to fix it. And they swept it under the rug. Free sky. <clears throat> um, yeah. Another one that sweeps <laughs> things under the rug. All right. That's not a company you want to deal with. A company that you want to deal with has failures and it admits them and then corrects them. Something that says we're perfect. We never make a mistake. is full of shit. Okay. True. So, um, you know how, you know, I, up until a week ago, I said, I never lost an aircraft. Never. Guess what? Lost an aircraft. Yep, in my own backyard. Thanks to crappy equipment to somebody that said, oh, it works perfectly, and it didn't. Okay? I won't Happens. tell you what transpired, <laughs> but basically they were really upset with me for telling the world their equipment is shit for the third time because I bought five receivers from them and not a single one lasted past six flights. Ouch. Well, they they were very happy to send me five receivers that actually are still in my aircraft and still working, but the ones I physically purchased never worked past six flights. Yeah. this I also wrote them a manual on how to fix their fail-safe issues, gave them a product, wrote them a manual, and said, here, install this, problem solved, and they didn't do it. Gave it away. Those are the companies you don't want to buy from. Those are the companies who you will, I promise you, lose your aircraft if you fly long range. Okay? And there's some of them out there. If they claim we've never had a problem, guess what? You're going to lose your aircraft because they're full of it. They're absolutely 100% full of it. If you have never had a problem, you've never stretched your legs. Right. Or if you have, you have stretched your legs, you've had a problem. So that's the other thing is don't trust the hype. Don't trust what marketing tells you. Trust the experience, guys. Look at people who are successful. What are they running and how are they doing it? Right. Okay, there's certain equipment that they don't. Look, the popular equipment is not what gets you there. It's stuff that nobody's talking about. Believe it or not, Futaba Fast System. Futaba Advanced Spread Spectrum Technology. I remember when I first started flying FPV. Kevin Hines and I go send that 2.4 gigahertz system out over a mile over a landfill. All right. And then I physically tried to block it. Like I took the antenna, put it out of polarization, and that stupid thing held on. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, Kevin, if we lose control, I'll put it back. And he's like, don't do it. I'm like, I'm doing it anyway. And I turned his antenna. It's still held. He's like, oh, my God, it's holding. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll put it back now. Because <laughs> I go, I don't want you to lose your airplane anymore. Uh, you know. <laughs> so Utaba, out. you don't hear, they're not hyped up. Solid system. All right? It's the systems you don't hear about. DTF UHF. That's what Elvin just had. Yeah. Hell up. You don't hear about it, do you? That's what I personally run. That's what gets you there. But let me explain to you. Using a system improperly doesn't get you there. Nah, me, wait, 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 wait. Let let's let me let me let me uh do my knock upside the head too, because uh if you wanna do DTF UHF or Flytron. Uh, equipment for 433. That's the way to go. If you buy open LRS receivers, you're bound to crash. You're <laughs> going to lose your shit. I'm telling you because I've spent a year going through 18 receivers and 
I get two good flights, and then I get one shitty one. And the one shitty one is the rebuild. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't actually program your own hopping channels or scheme in it, do you? Uh, I I did at one time, and then I had issues with that, so I just went back to default and left it. Yeah. See, I do I program my, in my own slew rate to keep it from jumping around too much. See, I we need to talk. <laughs> open LRS. Look, that's the thing about Open LRS. You have to know what you're doing. Remember, understand yes. your equipment and really understand how it's working. I've learned the defects of Open LRS and I've worked my way around them. Um, if you set your hopping channels too far apart, if it's like hopping 10 megahertz per channel, that it's a slew rate problem. It's jumping too fast. It'll lose frequency lock. So what you want to do is work your way up, then down. So you want to sequentially work your way up in frequency, then back down. And that's, that builds a slew rate, in, and that'll help you fix some of your problems. We'll that That's a problem with ETF <laughs> UHF that I found. Okay, again, experience. Right. Um, but I, I'm going to say right now, I'll give you a story that people didn't know about. Right now, the hot long-range system is the TBS Crossfire. Mm -hmm. And TBS Crossfire is having some fail-safe issues. Um, so I found six people that had fail-safe issues, and I made them a folded microwave loop antenna. Mm -hmm. They swore they'd never use Crossfire ever again in their life. I said, let me just try this antenna for me and give me your feedback. They said, fine. They turned around and said, man, Crossfire is absolutely amazing. That antenna fixed all my problems. Choosing the right equipment. TBS, listen to what I had to say. And now they are manufacturing it. And that antenna will come out in a couple of days, I think. I, no, not a couple of days. Probably about three or four weeks out where they're going to actually have this because TBS – understands that some people sit when they fly and that was what was causing the fail safe so even though the crossfire is way over specified because i know we were in hong kong and we flew over shenzhen all right there's a picture of me holding the airplane that we had previously flown from hong kong island and surfed buildings in shenzhen now mind you he was finding his transmitters ramping up the power for no apparent reason and he's like alex change the channel I'm like what <laughs> He's like, yeah, change the channel from I, I'm on 868. Go to 915. I'm literally, he's flying. I'm, I'm literally crouched down on the back of his crossfire, changing from 868 to 915. Before I hit the acknowledge button, I'm like, are you sure this is going to work? He's like, yes. I hit the button. I was sure that plane was going to end up in Shenzhen. It swapped frequencies. Power level dropped. He was fine. Noise wow. floor. Shenzhen's noise floor was trashing that airplane's transmission. Changed it. No problem. We flew for, it was an airplane. We flew for like 50 minutes on a single battery that day, testing out the new Cyprenia too, is what we were doing. Um, noise floor. But had we were running the, had we run the folded microwave loop, it would had, he would have noticed he had a problem, but we wouldn't have had to change the channel because it would have performed better. Should he have? Yes, obviously it was a better idea to do that. But, um, like I said, I came out with this antenna. Um, I've got some military, Military clients that are now using this, same reason. Um, some professional clients, you know, commercial end that are using it. And now TBS is going to release it. Um, I actually released it for the Tyrannus. It's uh, called the Microwave Dipole or Microwave Loop. I don't even remember what it's called anymore. It's like 25 bucks. Um, and, and it fixes a lot of fail-safe problems with the Tyrannus. So, again, using the right equipment um, is key. But the reason why I'm telling you the, problem, the thing with the Crossfire is – we're flying from Hong Kong Island into mainland Shenzhen, China, surfing buildings on, a, on equipment that's tested. And we tested this like – I mean this has been tested for ridiculously long range. I mean it's been tested like 25, 30 miles. Wow. Uh, it's got all these goofy modes. It self-scales its own power. It's an amazing system. So how are people locking out at short range? Well, again, it's that antenna. But you may know that there was a video posted about a year ago where Steel Davis post – tumbled down the side of the tallest building in Atlanta. Steele Davis lives just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and he tried to surf the tallest building in Atlanta on Crossfire. He failed safe about two-thirds of the way up, and a quadcopter came tumbling down the side of the building before he recovered it. Okay, he didn't crash, but he recovered it uh, fairly low altitude. People tarnished him. They trashed him, saying how reckless he was. I posted two words old hat and posted a video from five years earlier where we surfed the same building running 72 megahertz control with an airplane the difference 
I had a spectrum analyzer in my pocket. I scanned the frequencies and figured out what wasn't going to lock out. And we mm. chose that accordingly. That 72 megahertz is like an extinct band. Nobody runs it anymore. What Steele did wrong is he flew into the null of his own antenna. Okay, so that, and again, he is using an open loop antenna near the ground. That's a bad idea for long range. Mm -hmm. Inexperience. He didn't realize that altitude is very, especially right over your own head, is very taxing on a system. Yeah. We weren't at the base of the building. We were at a convention center parking lot one and a quarter miles away. Most people would think that's more difficult. No, we stacked the deck in our favor. It made it easier. Before we surfed the building, we went around behind it to make sure we had plenty of link budget just to make sure we were going to make it. We also had our RSSI, our relative signal strength indication, on our screen so we knew immediately if there was going to be a problem that we'd be able to fix it. If you want to look it up on Utah Tube, it's under Stone Blue Airlines channel called Operation Skyfall. So, again, this is before LRS systems existed that we did this. And even with a modern day LRS not using it properly, you're not going to make it. So that problems. crossfire can outdistance that 72 megahertz any day of the week and twice on Sunday. But not using it, not being familiar with its limitations is what caused steel to tumble down the side of the building and us to surfing. So you have to learn how to use this stuff and you have to fail before you're going to be successful. Uh, yeah. That's the funny thing about analog is that everybody thinks, oh, I buy this and it's going to fix all of my problems. And it never does because analog well, is digital voodoo. Well, digital covers up the problem because it tries to program around it. Analog, when you've got a problem, it shows you. You're like, I'm not Here working right, right now. Yeah. Hello, there's a problem. You and got guess what? radio, more. Yeah, and guess what? <laughs> you have a chance to correct that, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, I, I hate to, 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 to beat a dead horse, but really, it, it, you have to learn. No matter what your equipment is, you have to learn it and learn its limitations. Right. Um, the best equipment, I'd rather have, you know, 20-year-old equipment, you know, 50 megahertz radio, old 900 megahertz video knowing how it works and how to use it than the latest crossfire dragon link and the two watt 5.8 megahertz uh, 500 gigahertz transmitter not knowing a daggone thing about it it's knowing how to use your equipment is the biggest divide and the yeah. only way you're going to learn it is to go push it until it fails right please don't do it in the city <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah right. please don't do it in the that, city. Okay, that's called, that's called irresponsibility. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, that, that learning it, it comes with a little bit of responsibility. A lot yeah. of responsibility goes with it. You know uh, that again. That's that's part of the spotter thing. Fly out in the countryside. The spotter says, "Hey, you got air traffic. Turn around and come the heck back. Right. We don't need another drone spotting. All right, just come back." Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's the truth, man. All right, so uh, okay, so three three thumbs up for you. Yes, 3.3 is now getting my thumbs up, officially. It's a really great system. I highly encourage anybody to go try it, um, especially if you are flying in races and sick of people stomping on your video, noobs powering up on your channel going, oops, sorry, I crashed you because I didn't know what channel I was on. You never have that problem with 3.3, or 2.3 for that matter, but 2.3, you've got to run Crossfire. 2.3, uh, you got to run 2.3 video, run Crossfire. Yep, that's what I do, personally. Yeah. So, um, or 7.2, hey. but... Quad guys, you you I don't know where you're gonna put a 39 inch antenna on a mini quad. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the almost awesomest antenna on a mini quad. <laughs> you know, you know how many people try to pull the antenna out of my airplane when I land? They go, right. man, you have this wire hanging out of the airplane. You start pulling out like, no, 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 that's my antenna. Don't, don't touch it. Leave it alone. <laughs> I go through that like every time I go to an event. Every time Got I go to that, wire hanging. tries to pull the wire. Got a wire hanging, dude. <laughs> I'd be crazy Every in his old time. ass shit. Hey. Every time. Listen, old I've works, traveled bro. to a lot of events. I'd be crazy. He's the only one where he takes care of his radio more than his suitcase, okay? Like, I'm literally walking around the airport. I see I'd be crazy. And, like, his radio <laughs> is, like, in this, like, personal hand. No, it's, it's, like, literally with him at all times. It's, like, it's, like, it's, <laughs> you're the only one that I know that does that. Hey, got to take care of your equipment if it's going to take right. care of you, right? Right. 
that was uh, was that in California or Hawaii when you that was you're Hawaii. Like, Dude, just get a card. Yeah, <laughs> get a was... card. I'm like, I'm not leaving my radio. <laughs> exactly. I was like, like, dude, literally, he just refused <laughs> to let that thing out of his sights. Like, his personal baby. Yeah. I'm just saying. Uh, that's how it is, man. All right. Well, let's let's start wrapping this up. Um, like for video, so, I think we covered everything. Uh, Elvin, you got anything? Before I, I start grabbing, we, yeah, we're we're good, we're good. We uh we talked about the noise floor and uh you know uh is more power better? No, you know it's not really sometimes, better. sometimes, but in general, too much power is a problem. Yes, yeah. Right. There's and, two things I want to talk about before we wrap up. It's right. spectrum analyzers and how to position the antenna correctly, both on a wing and a quad, because we get a lot of those questions. So, yeah. spectrum analyzer, what do you recommend as the spectrum analyzer, and how are you supposed to use it? Because a lot of people probably just, I don't know, look at the bars and say, oh, I'm okay. Okay, so a spectrum analyzer, again, it's a learning tool. You need to actually learn how it works. It, it, it's a piece of, uh, of equipment that uh, requires a bit of knowledge. I've got videos on how to fox hunt a downed aircraft with one, and that's a really good video of seeing how it responds yes. to a signal oh. getting stronger. Nice. So if you lose your aircraft in the field, you can actually use the signal strength to go find it. Look at that video. Jason was looking for his quad for like 20 minutes, couldn't find it, and I found it in about 45 seconds. And went, is this what you're looking for? And he was like 300 feet away. Um, it, it, I mean, a transmitting system to a spectrum analyzer is like a smoking gun. It's like, I know where you are. You can't hide from me. Right. Um, so a spectrum analyzer, what you do is you hook your receiver antenna up into the spectrum analyzer and turn it on. And I usually use um, – there. I use a RF Explorer. It's fairly inexpensive. It's it's When I say fairly inexpensive, it's like $400. But compared right. to my Ag Agilent Field Fox, Field Fox, which comes in at like $20,000, it's really cheap. Um and it's good enough. And the, the, what I typically use is a max, the max or max hold, because that's going to show me burst transmissions on my band. I program it to run on my, to, to get on my channel, plus or minus 15, 20 megahertz. I screw the re same receiver antenna that I'm going to use into the spectrum analyzer, turn it on, and analyze the noise floor. If I don't see any spikes or anything out of the ordinary, I know I'm clean and I can go fly because I'm using my own antenna aimed in the right direction with a device that's scanning. Um, it takes a little bit of working to, to really understand and trust it, but if you're going to do long range, definitely a great tool to troubleshoot so you know what you're about to be up against before you fly. And this also includes doing it on your control band. Again, max or max hold will show you the burst transmissions as well as the ambient noise floor now do you have that running on your flight or do you just just check i it turn it on check it then turn it back off because when i'm in flight i'm in the goggles i'm not looking at it i'm okay. hoping that something doesn't power on even though it could later in the afternoon you're better your most of your high power transmission systems are turned off so you're going to have better success later in the afternoon than early in the morning or mm -hmm. midday uh, because businesses typically run nine to five, and that's who's typically going to be using these high power transmission systems. So, yep. um, you know, your your golden hour um, right now at this time of the year is probably about six to six fifteen. Um, is really where you want to take off in the summer. You want to push it a little closer to seven. Um, so you want enough daylight to make it out and come back, but that's typically when everything's pretty quiet. Um, you know, night's not such a bad idea if you feel comfortable because, like I said, all that stuff's turned off. Just be sure you have a lit up aircraft so other airplane, other aircraft in the air can identify it, and you can identify them really easily because you can see a green or red light moving across the sky. You go, oh, that's a manned aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so at night's not such a bad idea. It just takes a little bit more confidence to do it at night, but it is definitely a little bit more secure. There's typically less wind at night as well. Um but I, I, I'm not going to recommend night flying because there, there's some other risks inherent to night flying. Um, but if you feel comfortable flying at night, go for it. Um, you know, I, I remember flying long range with Jeremiah, who had a low voltage buzzer on his airplane. And he's like, oh, it just goes off all the time. Well, as soon as we took off our goggles, there's two police cars sitting right there going, what are you guys doing? Because <laughs> my airplane's lit up like a Christmas tree, you know, so other aircraft can identify it. And what do the cops do? They just followed it back. I'm like, oh, there it is. And they just kept driving until they found us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, so oh, dear. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting night. <laughs> are, are you, are you, you got infrared cameras on there? Are you trying to, trying to peek in my wife's window? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I yep. mean, it, it's there's I, so again, there's there's positives and negatives to doing any type of flying. It's right. just you've got to learn it. And, and, and listening to this podcast gives you a foundation, but it doesn't teach you everything you need to know. You've got to go out and do it yourself. You got to cool. go out and do hey, it. Hey, got to go and do it. The video that you uh, you talked about to use it as a like a quad finder or a wing finder. Do you remember the title? Um, fox hunting with an RF explorer. Fox hunting yeah. with an RF explorer. Fox I'm gonna have to look that up. Explorer. Cool. Yeah. And you'll watch because what happened is after I recovered the aircraft, Jason and I staged this where we explained what happened. And I'm explaining what I'm about to do to the camera while Jason is in the background burying his quad in the weeds. And he went and set it down while I'm explaining it. He realized I still was yakking to the camera. And he went and, and moved it around, like buried it underneath the grass and fold the gr like grass up to our knees. Fold the grass over it deliberately and put it upside down so the antenna was like embedded in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And he's thinking, eh, he's not gonna find it. And sure enough, I'm, 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 I got the camera on my uh, on my spectrum analyzer. And I'm going through it, and I'm going, I'm looking at the spectrum analyzer. I'm looking at the ground, going, it's the quadcopter should be right here. Where is it? <laughs> buried it. And I'm going, I'm looking, going, and I saw one of the one of the motors. I'm like, Jason, you <laughs> just, just laughing, smiling ear to ear. He's like, you got it, you got me. You couldn't, you can't hide from it. Right. It's amazing how well it works. But yeah, yeah, he tried to hide it. You cannot hide from a spectrum analyzer. That's a great cool. lost aircraft tool. Hey, great that's a fun. great tool. But the instant you stop transmitting, it doesn't help you. It's done. Right. It's done. So if it unplugs, you're still screwed. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Make sure battery right, secure in there. It. That's it. Right there. Two straps, boys. Two, Two straps. straps. Two straps. Hold okay. In. So hey, hey, before we go, before we go, I I, I um don't forget I wanna I wanna answer the question. Um, about wavelength uh, that a lot of the Tyrannus and, and FR Sky guys have, have been going over with, whether they should be using a five, one, one fifth wavelength, one quarter wavelength antenna. And uh, can you, can you explain that? You know, no. <laughs> I have a video on it. I have a video uh, on it. Why I modified the 2.4, the rate, the antenna on my two, four radio. Okay. okay. And what I do is I go through computer, computer simulation, simulating the stock antenna, mm -hmm. the 5 dBi, and my microwave folded loop. And I simulate it standing up and sitting down. And what you're going to do is see the effect of ground on the video, or on, excuse me, on the RF transmission system um, in a graphical form, in 3D graphical form. And it's pretty obvious why I chose what I did. It doesn't matter whether I was standing up or sitting down, the folded microwave antenna was better. However, standing up, I had like five and a half dB gain because the ground actually amplified my signal. But on the stock antenna and the 5 dBi mod, which are very popular, it killed it. So high gain does not necessarily mean longer range. High gain means more directive. And when the ground's involved, high gain means more scattered too. So again, look at the guys who do this routinely who know what they're doing and you gotta wonder do they know do they if they can tell you why they know they that's why they trust their equipment they know why they're using their equipment do, if they say well it just works don't trust that they could be one of the lucky ones they say well it works because you know it doesn't react with the ground so much or it, i can point this really well at the horizon or you know i aim the null of the antenna at the aircraft and when it gets when i start to lose signal i just lift it up in the air and, and get my signal back that's what you want to hear not well it just works and <laughs> don't listen to well it just works ever uh, it's a good way to lose your aircraft okay you, you, you just lost your money you just lost your money. That's terrible. And the time you spent building the aircraft, too. Hold yeah. Up. All right, Alex, last question before we start wrapping up. Uh, your, for your receiver antenna and for your VTX, really, um, how should you mount your antennas? Like uh, Never on you... the goggles for long range. Never. Because you, I do the Stevie Wonder. Everybody does. They look around. Yeah. Um, you want to point your – remember I told you fly landmarks? Aim that antenna at the landmarks. Use a tripod, dedicated receiver, and run cables to your goggles. You want to get as far away from that receiver antenna as possible because your radio system is going to, your control system is going to interfere with it. Right. So take that antenna, 
and aim it at those those points on the horizon where you'll be flying to to use as landmarks and go fly to them and stay as far back from that ground station as possible. Five, six feet is usually enough. And that's really what it what it comes down to. A great antenna to use. I personally, if I'm going to fly range, I typically use a crosshair. Um, nice cone, high axial ratio, high front to back ratio. On the aircraft, if I'm going to fly a quad long range, um, a quad long, actually most, if I'm actually, if I'm going for 5.8 gigahertz, I'm going to use an ion antenna because it is higher gain and I'm not going mm-hmm. into steep banks. Um, or the other cho- choice I usually use if I'm not using an ion, like if I, because I, the ion isn't available for anything but 5.8, but if I'm, I'm running 3.3 or 2.3, I use an air blade, which is left hand. The right handed equivalent is a mad mushroom. Okay. Um, but honestly, if you're getting into 1.3 or 900, the most underrated antenna in FPV is called the biquad. The biquad with a dipole or a V is seriously long range. It's a great combination. It's not this monstrously large, circularly polarized antenna, and it'll get you there. It is the most under, the biquad is the most underrated antenna in FPV, and I've flown one for years. They're great. They work awesome. So, um, just uh, ones I wouldn't recommend patch. If you're using a patch, <laughs> throw it in the trash. Patch antennas are worthless. Okay. <laughs> this is coming from the guy who designed the TBS patch, who gets a royalty on every one that's sold. Don't use a patch. Wow. Okay. This is a guy who wow. gets a royalty when one's sold. I'm telling you not to use it. Okay. Don't use a patch. I don't care who made it. Don't use a patch. There you go, um, folks. Because everybody right. uses patches. That's the funny thing. <laughs> By the way, the Crosshair is also sold under another name. It's called the X-Air. The X-Air is made by Hugo of TrueRC Canada. He was a co-developer on that project. So don't feel wrong about supporting him and not me. We're we're friends. Go ahead. If you like the X-Air because it's got a brass back plate um, as opposed to my uh, galvanized steel back plate, go for it. It's not and, and, and it doesn't matter. I broke them both. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, by the way, if you're, if you're looking for cheap option, Helical's a great cheap option. Yeah, I, I still use mine. You know, I went to Alex. Hey, man, what the hell? My hand broke. He's like, I'll just, just put some hot glue back. <laughs> I think I soldered yours. Yeah. You <laughs> I'm not going to hot glue your antenna back together. Yeah. I'm going to do it right. But, yeah, I mean, they're, they're occasionally we, we've had some that have failed. Um, and if, if one fails for whatever reason, just tell me. I'll fix it or replace it. It's because I threw my goggles down. That's all. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. maybe I shouldn't have fixed it for him. Uh, <laughs> and the story comes out. Uh huh. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, um, the other thing is use a good receiver. There, there's a big discrepancy in receivers. I mean, some people, uh, and I, I, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the, under the bus, but if you're doing long range, you're using an immersion duo or a fat shark receiver, that's not going to get you there. You need a, 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 a something that's based on the old boss cam, now, now known as FXT, um, to get you there. So, um, like I said, try and try to avoid the, the goggles because of the, you know, tend to doing Stevie wonder. Um, but I've seen the forge go really far. Um, as far as a goggle module, I've seen a TBS goggle module go really far, but really you want a dedicated receiver. Um, the FXT 632 is a really good, if you want to do diversity, um, that's a really good one. RC 832 is a pretty good one. The old boss camp 30, uh, RC 305 is oh, a good wow. receiver. Um, Granted, these are old, but they're pretty well solid. Um, don't go for one with the bells and whistles. Go for one that's got the solid R- the, the solid RF tech in there. Um, so you want the boss cam base. And unfortunately, um, you know, not everybody has switched there. So, um, so as far I know, a lot of people are asking, well, what about the clear view? I've never used the clear view. I have no experience with it. I'd love to say it's amazing, but I haven't tried it. Until I try it, I can't recommend it. Um, I hear it's great. Um, but, and I would assume because I've met Ira, the, the inventor personally, and I've heard a lot of good reports, but I just don't know. And, and so I really don't want to stick my neck out and say it works well without, without actually experiencing it. Without experiencing it. I, I get you. Plus that's a, that's a very high, Ira, uh, you know how, you know how to contact us. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a pricey one for, uh, you know, the, the analog it size. Is. So it is. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to do the do range. You just you have to. I don't care how much money you spend. You still have to know the equipment. Definitely. And I said earlier, I'd rather have old old equipment that and, and know how it works 
than modern equipment that I don't have a clue how it works. Yes, you know? gran- yes, Grandpa, I'd be crazy. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I know, I know your love of old equipment. Okay, I've seen most of it as you hunk it around. Look at this. Hold on, right let, me, let me get. Let me. Okay, I just yeah, got out of the way. Right that behind. oscilloscope down there—that's from the 1950s. You know why I have it? Still works because, like a chip. And because the one above it is digital. If ah. there's something going on in the signal, that digital one won't pick it up. But that analog one—it's got vacuum tubes in it for goodness' sake. <laughs> Okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> vacuum tubes don't lie. You can put two tubes. squirrels in that thing and it'll work. <laughs> See? So again, it's understanding equipment and its limitations. I've got the digital one, it's really nice, and it's it's nice to get the signal on the screen and trigger is easy. I can save it, I can do all kinds of stuff. But honestly, when I'm troubleshooting, I plug in the analog from the literally, I think that was built in 1958. I mean, just getting I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. 57 or 58, it's an old Heath kit. Okay. Yeah. Equipment Works like has its limitations. Understanding it, that's how you manipulate it. That's how you're successful. Yeah, I'd be I'd be crazy's bat cave. Here, he's always oh, got cool stuff going oh, on. Yeah. My <laughs> other bat cave is the garage. <laughs> hey, you know what? And by the that's way, everybody's I'm, I'm, man I'm cave. Just, well, I'm just as bad. I mean, I've got a I've got a garage full of antique motorcycles that I restore and as a hobby, you know. Oh I yeah, mean, you like posting those. I know, I know. Yeah, right. I like old I like old stuff. You know, I, I just, it's just, I just like it. I don't know. I just, you know, I, I just like old, old, old is gold, you know, it, it, right. it just, it works. Yeah. It just works. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just it. The new stuff, um, the new stuff, it, you know, if something goes wrong with a modern car, you hook a computer up to it and say, Hey, what's wrong with it? Right. Something goes wrong with an old car. You go, okay, let's drive down the street, floor it. Oh, I got a miss. <laughs> I think my main jet in the carburetor's clogged. Yep, that that would be what that is. Clean it out, and you're good to go. You don't need a computer. That's my five that. ten right there. Ear. You know, you need an ear. Mm. I think we're out of time. You know that kind of thing. Right. You know, it's it's a different method of troubleshooting. It's what you're comfortable with. Get that yeah. long screwdriver out. That's oh. it. I mean, and I feel more comfortable with the old analog solutions because I've seen them, I've experienced with them, and I can play with them. I can, I can manipulate them um, to my advantage better. That's the big key with analog is you do need a wealth of experience to be really comfortable with them. I know right. a lot of old flyers that like they, they can look at an analog signal and be like, oh, I know what it is. And I'm like, dude, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, think about it like this. Damn channel, dude. <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll put it this way. What's a glitch? Elvin. When we say glitch, you remember back in the day, what was a glitch? It, it went. The aircraft suddenly did something you did not tell it to do. It twitched. It momentarily stopped responding, and causing go, you to go, go ooh, hell? what happened? Turn around, turn around. <laughs> or, 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 okay. What, and some people, would it, it ended up wadding up a perfectly good aircraft because they, they, it, they panicked. Right. What happens when you get a glitch on a uh, 2-4 radio? Oh, you lose, you lose it. <laughs> Boom into the ground. We call that a fail safe. Right. Analog glitches. It twitches and flies through it, and still keeps digital, going. Yeah, digital locks out. It is true to this. Yeah, that signal. It. Boom. Okay, that's the difference. Analog gives you a warning. Digital says goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. You're done. Sometimes you recover. Sometimes, some, okay. I'm being nice. You always. <laughs> I remember flying outside the range of a JR receiver when they first started flying. I was 6,300 feet away, flying a JR full range receiver. I was flying a tilt cam, and all of a sudden the tilt cam started to shake. Oh, there we go. Hi, <laughs> Elvin's got the JR out. XP 9303. Yeah. The tilt cam started to shake, and I went, "Man, that's odd. What's going on?" And I'm 6,300 feet out. I'm over a mile, and I'm going. What the heck? And I'm low. I'm like buzzing the treetops too. I'm going, what's going on with this thing? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I got to turn around. Something's not right. I turned around and, you know, get back to within a mile and it stops. I'm like, was I at the end of my range? I turned around and sure enough, that tilt cam starts shaking. I go, oh boy, I was at the end of my receiver. <laughs> <laughs> it warned me. And I had enough to turn around and come back. You know what happens if I'm flying too far? It was in the tree, and I never saw it again. 
Yeah, you, know, you just start walking. Again, analog. <laughs> analog, man. It, it's just, you learn. You learn. It gives you that warning. Uh-oh, something's going to go wrong here. Uh-oh, uh-oh. So if you don't have analog, you want that RSSI on your screen because that instead of having that glitch, it's you watch those numbers drop. Go, oh, oh, oh weak signal, something's wrong. Turn around, turn around, warning, that kind of thing. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna say this too. The RSSI sometimes it lies to you. I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna say that sometimes it'll drop drastically, like to the point where yes. you're like, what? What? No. Yeah, that's <laughs> called fade margin. What you're running into too is what's called fade margin. If it drops drastically. Um, you're typically getting what's called multipath fading, which is basically your signals uh, and the reflected signal are, are hitting the receiver 180 degrees out of phase. Um, if it drops, really, or you got hit by burst transmission. Um, RSSI is relative signal strength and not absolute. So right. it's not perfect. Again, it's learning how to read that. Again, learning the equipment. It's not per- RSSI isn't perfect, but it's a really good tool to tell you when you're about to hit the wall. Yep. Right. So, Cool if beans. you're going out, you're flying, and you got 80, 80 percent, or 80, 80 on the signal meter, and then it drops down to like 20, then pops back up to 80, then drops back down to 20. Turn your ass around. <laughs> yeah, if it, if it cycles, if it's going up, down, up, down, up, down, well, the first thing before you turn your butt around, stay in place, circle, and climb. See right. if you can see, see if it gets more stable because it's very possible you have a tree top or something in somewhere in in breaking the line of sight. And but if if you stay there and you circle, and it doesn't and you climb, thus clearing a Fresnel zone violation, and it's still doing that, turn around and come back. But I, I would use that as now. Let's say if you don't feel comfortable with it, like if it stabilizes, but you're not comfortable with it, turn around and come back anyway. It doesn't mean if it stabilizes, then you could just go. If you don't feel comfortable, you know that that little that little voice inside your head said, "Don't do this." Still come back. But again, if you've got control, you know, try to use that as a learning experience if you can, because you're gonna you're gonna want to try it again. And so the more you learn, the the more experience you gain on that one flight. And, and learn learn how to turn around. Oh yeah, with using the minimum amount of video. You know what I mean. To learn at minimum amount of bank angle. Right. If you're on an airplane, try to yeah. turn flat. If you're in a quad, yaw. Right. Do not do do not hit this hard turnaround. Just take a right. lazy, lazy, Cruise. lazy. Turn. Yep, lazy turn. Lazy turn. turn. All right, last. Oh question. yeah. Oh, go ahead. Last, last thing. thing. For God's sake, do not aim the antenna straight out the back of your quad. Oh, yeah. If that's a good one. If you were at the riot open, that was the number one complaint I got from pilots. I can't see. Those wings are stepping on my video. I can't see. Yeah, that's because all the wings have their antenna upright on their airplane. And everybody who complained about bad video had their antenna sticking straight out the back of their quad. Well, guess what? That's the no. The signal comes out the side of the antenna. So make sure your antenna is upright. I can't count the number of people. I said, get them over the wing area. Tell them to bring their quad. They bring their quad over. I take the antenna, bend it upright, send them back over. Go, well, what's that supposed to do? Fix the problem. You know? All right? That's just the way it is. You've got to orient both correctly. Not only the receiver, which is mostly what I'm focused on, but the transmitter antenna, got to be upright. That goes for control, too. Your control, upright, just like the ground station. Upright. So the control in your hand, upright. On the quad, upright. Don't tape it to the freaking frame. Terrible idea. That that blocks your own signal. Right. Stick it out on a little straw. Put it upright. That's all it needs. Okay? There you go. Again, Good advice. Learning above equipment. The above the frame or below the frame. And anybody who's listened this long, you should be taking notes. Notice how I keep going, oh, yeah, I forgot this. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. Guess what? There's a lot of stuff I'm, I'm, all, I'm forgetting right now. Okay? <laughs> Send <laughs> all your questions to Elvin. <laughs> <laughs> all right so take notes but understand i'm not telling you everything because there's a lot of things i'm forgetting right now right oh yeah there's always something all right la- last question this all is right. actually not a long range question this is a question okay. that i get from other people the pagoda how does it rank amongst like another antenna like your ion because like the pagoda design has gotten really popular it's i know it's an open source design and yeah, just like cloverleaf yeah yeah, right. Uh, it's Clover the Skew Planner. We were the first. The um, you know there are there are this Pagoda. The Pagoda was open source, but not really 
a do-it-yourselfer um, because obviously you have to got to get the circuit boards made. But, like the Cold Relief was really a do-it-yourself project. Like you could just right. buy a big building wire and make it. Um, the issue with the Pagoda is people want it to be protected. So they put covers or heat shrink tubing on it, which absolutely wrecks the performance. It makes the antenna perform like absolute dog dirt. So if you have a Pagoda and it's got a cover on it, I guarantee you it's not performing nearly as well as an antenna designed to have a cover. See, Martin Bayert designed it really, really well. But Martin Bayer doesn't fly quads that crash every time they land. So he wasn't focused on durability. So what right. do the people do? They go, well, I can fix it. I can cover it. What well, wrecked right. the signal propagation. And so you have a choice to pick out. Either fly it exposed and deal with repairing it and replacing it. Or you choose something that's designed to take a wreck, like a TBS Triumph or an Axie mm -hmm. or an Ion or a Duraspec that's designed to actually handle mini quad crashes. It's a good antenna. It's just not – once you make it durable, then it's not such a good antenna anymore. Okay. And Thank I, you. Yeah, that's – it's – honestly, I like the design. Great work. If you're flying an airplane, all day long. Goggle antenna, all day long. Just no mm -hmm. cover on it. It, it just it just wrecks it. I have a vector network analyzer. I've tested dozens of them. Also, don't buy a cheap one. For goodness sake. The cheaper they are, the worse they perform. I've seen some real crap. Um, I, I'm not going to toss. Yes, I am. <laughs> Garbage. Are you uh, serious? Menace. <clears throat> Garbage. Mm. All right. Reckon uh, me a good one because I do like far them. View. Good. Who? Far view. Good. Far good, view. Good. Uh, far view. Strix. Good one. Why? Okay. These That's are guys. No cover. That, oh, um, B rotor honey drop. Absolute shit. No cover. <laughs> okay. Anything from Banggood. They don't even bother aligning the circuit boards from Banggood. They sent hey. me a bunch of different brands from Banggood. They're like, oh, advertise these for us. They said review, but what they meant was advertise. I'm like, yeah, right. Like the plates aren't even lined up. I can see the tick marks that Martin gave you to align them, you know, get them straight. And you didn't even bother manufacturing that. My, what? my, my favorite, Alex, is the, the uh, 2.4, 5.8 dual antenna. Oh, did you see the video on that? Oh, my God. I was did like. Did you know that Mark sprung that on me? He actually <laughs> you know, he put the video camera in my office. Yeah. Okay. Turned it on recording and handed this to me. And I'm like, what is this? I opened it up and was like at a loss for words and went, okay, they attempted to make a Spironet, they attempted to clone a Spironet antenna, but couldn't quite figure out how to solder it. So they just cut two of the lobes halfway. Right. It was one of the absolute worst pieces of junk. They I called it a dual band seen. antenna. Dual There's a lot of crap out there. Like, if you're complaining about video and thinking about ramping up your power, try changing your antenna. Just buy one from somebody who knew what they were doing. Do it, yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to buy from Video Aerial Systems, okay? That's my company. I would be happy if you bought it from me, but you don't have to. There's some great companies out there. Strix is a, is a good company. That's Ready Made RC's brand. Uh, True RC, that's can that's True RC in Canada. That's uh, Hugo Chamberlain Hugo, that's yeah. earlier. Uh, Lumineer's got a pretty good one. That's the Axie. That was actually designed by True RC Canada. Um, these at Farview, I told you there, that's a really good pagoda out there. All right. There are other brands out there that know what they're doing. Right. But if you're going on to Amazon going, I think this is going to work. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll put you like this. I'll have better, better videos spending half the amount of money on my my equipment, my video transmitter and my camera and my receiver and all that kind of stuff, and spending an extra $5 on the antenna than you will buying the best video transmitter camera and all that stuff out there with that piece of junk on her. Right. It's, just, it's just how it is. Just it's uh, The antennas, honestly, the most important component is the receiver more than the antenna, but the second most important is the antenna system. All right. So Biggest thing ruining right. the sport right now in terms of racing in 5.8 is bad VTXs and antennas. I swear, every single time, oh, it's bad like... Bad VTX is a big one. Oh, God. I, I, said, I, said, I said three months ago that 80% of the guys out there that are bitching about their video on 5.8 is running shitty equipment. Yeah. It's either, it's either the bad VTX, bad antennas, or... The feed line from the antenna, from the transmitter to the antenna, because it, you know, 
Well, they'll bury it inside the yeah. frame or uh, they'll yeah. split or they yeah. have the crappy UFL connections. I wish we could get away from those pieces. Right. Yeah. Um, people talking, don't understand right. how Amazon works. What people do is people in the States go, oh, I found a manufactured video transmitters on Amazon. They go, how cheap can you make them? They say, oh, we can make them dirt cheap. What they do is they literally go, okay, then I'll give you so much money to ship them directly to Amazon and Amazon will fulfill them. Amazon takes over 50% of your profit when you do that. That's a really cheap way to make a quick buck. But those systems aren't tested. They're the junkiest out there. Honestly, sure, they're cheap because they're junk. You can imagine it, that the fact that you're paying $22 or $24 for video transmitter, guess what the vendor paid? Eight, okay? All right, that's how junk they are. So avoid Amazon, avoid Bang You Good or Bang Good or whatever the heck you call those guys. Buy from buy from uh, you know Heli Direct. They're supporting this. Buy from them. They're great guys. Yeah. Uh, I I know them. I know those guys. They're awesome. Uh, Ready Made RC, Strix, Stone yeah. Blue Airlines, uh, Lumineer, Get FPV. Uh, you know, any of those guys, they're, they're you know, the dedicated FPV, race day quads. I just spoke with him, even though we had an argument today. That's OK. We can disagree. Uh, <laughs> another good vendor. Um, they're OK. I mean, these are just buy the buy the guys that buy from the FPV vendors that specialize in the equipment because they know it. They trust it. They use it themselves personally. Well, like uh, Hobby Wireless. At, Hobby at Wireless. Uh, yeah, I, I already yeah. mentioned uh, Hobby Wireless Who's for the. Electrify RC system. They who's they developed the, who's that. the other? There was another wireless uh, 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 well, a while back. Future Hobbies went belly up. So uh, oh, that's the one. That's the one. Future Hobbies uh, went belly up. Digital Products DPC AV. They were the DPC first person. DPC AV. Yeah, that's I the one. Them years ago, years yeah. ago, when I first started, that's who I bought my first stuff from. Thomas Black. Mr. RC Cam himself, one of the first yep. people who published anything on FPV. That right. guy knows his stuff. Exactly. Holy smokes. That's the guy who designed the Oracle Diversity. And that's the guy that, that wrote the book, right? He, that's he the guy the, who first wrote the book on yeah, FPV. Yeah. Yep. yeah, yeah. Yep. You guys he go helps. check that. Get that book. I mean, it's got a lot of interesting tips in it. It'll teach you yeah. guys some stuff. That These guys that, are out there. They know what they're doing. They built their business on the fact they know what they're doing. Right. Um, Amazon, you have no idea what you're getting. Bang good, that's whatever cheap crap pumped out there. We have a right. phrase: buy cheap, buy twice. Yeah. You know, wow. just don't. <laughs> For VTXs, you know. I have another one: buy cheap, ruin somebody else's experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. serious. It's uh, bad. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm my... always the guy who gets stomped on too. I mean, too. I'm always the guy who gets his video knocked out. Without a doubt, I'm always the first guy to go down, which is why I don't run five eight anymore unless I absolutely have to. But yeah, it's uh, you know they're, we're going. I'm going to Flight Fest South, and they're going to do racing down there. You know, I'm running three three because those guys. I mean, honestly, you go to one of those big events that's not dedicated to FPV. People just plug in all day long. Right, <laughs> I right. have no idea what channel they're on. So I'm going to fly two three and three three, two bands that those guys don't have. I won't get shot down ever. Why? Because nobody's got my channels. Right. But yeah, that so. Um, pay attention to your equipment. Don't buy cheap. Don't buy cheap. Just, just, you know, it, it, I love how Josh Bixler put it. He, it. When he got into it, he goes, yay, eBay, two watt transmitter. I threw the plane. It was a free flight from there. <laughs> 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 you know, that's because anybody who's selling on eBay or Amazon doesn't have a reputation to uphold. They don't care. They'll sell to the next person that comes through because they're the cheapest. Somebody that's got a dedicated store, want you back gotta have they're, you they're back. gonna get you they back gotta have you back they, they're gonna get you back by selling you equipment that works and when you have a problem with it they're gonna help you fix it they're gonna help you solve that problem that's why you buy from an fev vendor that's why yeah. it's sure it's gonna cost you a little more but it's gonna cost you a lot cause you a lot less headache and a lot less money in the long run i promise yeah being cheap I, i'll say this too you know being DIY can be a great aspect of this. Let's well, not be cheap. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, let, right, me, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> Being DIY can be a great aspect of this hobby. And if you have the time to invest in all the, the equipment to do all the testing and all the stuff to get DIY stuff to work properly, that's a great way to go. Oh, yeah. But if 
you don't have all of that. Follow what the guys that are leading ahead of you. They're going to, if you call me up and you ask me what's a good system for doing two or three miles, I'll tell you. I'm not going to hide it from you. I'm not going to uh, avoid you from being able to do it. So, you know, call me, ask me. That's why we're here. We want you to have a great time out flying and welcome you back out the next time. And we want you to have the most successful flights because those are the flights that are going to cause you to pass the goggles over to someone else or introduce another pilot to something they've never seen or another person to something they've never seen before. So we it's want called extension of my success syndrome. Yes, we if do. We help you be successful. We're more successful. Exactly. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Extension of my success. That's, that's, that's how I put it. Every pilot that I help be successful in their goals makes me more successful in mine. Mm -hmm. That's Definitely. it. Yep. And we're all that. We were like, trust me. Uh, most of us are friendly people. I, I've very seldom met a, uh, I have very seldom met people in FPV that I really didn't get along with. I mean, granted, there have been a few, but um, they are very rare, thankfully. <laughs> um, so, you know, approach these guys, approach the experts with the appropriate, appropriate level of humility. Um, ask for help when you need it. It's yeah. not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. It's knowing your limitations. So nice. Go ahead. We're here to help. Um, you guys know how to get a hold of all three of us. You know, if you need, you need help, we're here to help you. I mean, you can PM, you can email or PM why myself, uh, Elvin, we're here to help. That's what, that's why we do these podcasts. That's, um, we don't want to hear about you losing your equipment. We want to hear I about, know. Hey, I heard what you ta we're talking about on the podcast and man, I just broke my three mile record today. Thank you very much. That's, that's what we want to hear. Yeah, exactly. Um, that, that's what we want to hear. That, that's what we're here for. So, all right, why? Yeah, you we'll end on a, yeah, we went, we'll end on a good note. Alex Greaves, better known as IB Crazy, thank you so much for giving us all your long range knowledge. I'm sure there's a whole lot more. We can probably make it like three more I videos. Try to, I try to hit what key points pop yes. into my head. I'm a scatterbrain, you know. If you ever seen the movie, if you ever seen the movie Up, I'm like the like the dogs, squirrel. Anything, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible with that. <laughs> oh, hey, so but you know, I try, I try to go over everything that I can. Um, and you know, I, I definitely, there's definitely a lot here that's missing, but as long as you make it a progressive goal, um, you know, incrementally do that, wreck your own signal, have a spotter, um, progress easy, progress easily. Um, buy or don't buy hyped equipment, buy known good equipment, um, you know, and analyze your own problems. Those are, that's really what's going to make you successful. Um, the rest I could, I could give you, I could write a, a, a 50 page book of everything you can do. And I, and then inevitably a good number of people are, are, are going to run into a problem that wasn't in that book. <laughs> you know, inevitably it's going to happen. So, um, the best way to learn is to go incrementally try to make it. Definitely. And if you don't make it, it's not failure. If you made it out and you had a problem and you brought it back, that's success. Learn from it and go try it again when you figure out what that problem was. If you didn't find that problem, get out there just about to where you had that problem and play around out there a little while while you got some battery life left and kind of push the edge until you have that problem and go and record that flight and go, okay, what was going on? What could possibly have happened? You know, and if you can't find, figure it out, send me the recording, tell me where you had the problem and I'll look it up and I'll see if I can help you. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, uh, if somebody's interested in, uh, talking to you, Ivy, where do they, where should they, uh, where do you like to hang out and get communication from? Uh, usually I prefer an email. Um, I, and uh, my, my, you can get you can email me through my website, videoaerialsystems.com, or you can just email me direct. My my most commonly responded email I check is videoaerial, a e r i a l at gmail.com. You can also get a hold of me via Facebook. Uh, granted, I don't check that a whole lot, and I tend to 
forget what I was talking about because I can't go through all the messages. So I can't remember what I told you earlier or what your problem was. I'll try. If it's a quick note, Facebook's fine. But if you really want an instruction, please email me. Uh, you know, so um, just just you know, and don't worry, you're not bothering me. I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to you when I when I have the when I have the time. And if you're really stuck, if you're really 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 stuck. And I understand it. You know, when you email me, put your phone number in there. I'll call you. He will call you, by the way. I, yeah, like, yeah. I'd be crazy. He's one of the most responsive people in the RC <laughs> industry I've ever known. And, like, he is very knowledgeable. So uh, have a notepad ready. Because yeah, will, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, had a guy, I called a guy yesterday or uh, three or four days ago. I was sitting down eating dinner um, at a at a sub shop down the road. And. He and you know, I started talking, and I told him, "Well, oh, here's what you got to do." And then he mentioned some equipment. Went, oh, okay, hold on, backpedal, change this, change this, change this. He's like, "Okay, yeah." And then he mentioned some, something else he was doing. Like, oh, hold on, <laughs> you might want to. I want to do that. As like as we're going through, I'm going, "Oh goodness, there's a lot more that's going to happen." <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot more that's like, going to. There's happen. a lot more that, that things are going to. Wealth of experience. He was modifying his Tyrannus is what it was to put my my microwave loop antenna in it. Oh. And then as we got to talking about it, he was talking about some of the other stuff he was using. I'm going, oh goodness, this is not going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So and 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 so, you know, if he didn't he did not know how to put that in an email to me. And it was just through talking to me. I just picked these little footnotes that he didn't know right. what to tell me. And I went, uh-oh. No, no, no. Don't do that. Please, for God's sake, don't do that. Yeah. Um, or, you know, oh, I'm going to buy a Dragon Link. Oh, oh, great. Which one? Oh, the V2. Oh, it's cheaper than the V3. And what video are you running? 1.3. Did you watch my LRS shootout where that performed the absolute worst on 1.3 video? Probably ought not do that. <laughs> you know? Go with the V. If you're going long range... Dragon Link on one three, Dragon Link V three, not two. I don't care if the two is cheaper. There's problems with it, you know. Things like that. It, it, we went through a bunch of those things. So, um, you know, I, I I don't care if you're not buying from me. It's I I, you, I don't you don't owe me anything. Just if you need if you need help, just email me your phone number and I'll call you when when I can. Yep, and. You can see him at events. He's been to a lot of events, and uh, he definitely yeah, gives you great cool. advice for getting the antennas. And he makes great quality antennas. I love his Airblades. Uh, best left-hand antennas I probably use on any of my quads. And, uh, yeah, hope to see you out in another event. Uh, thank you so much yeah, for got, your time, Alex. Wise. Right well, now. you'll see me at uh, Flight Fest South. That's my next one. And then Central Florida FPV <laughs> after that. And so uh, I'll be you. You got you see a, a wing race course up. You'll find me there. Yeah. Uh, and no, no, I'm not the one officiating. I'm competing. Uh, uh, oh, I might oh. not be the best pilot in the world, but I sure as that got a big. I definitely got the biggest smile on my face doing it. Right, so. And the brightest airplane out there usually. usually. Yeah, hot pink, hot pink. Oh, hot pink and black. And it's hot pink. It's mine. <laughs> Alex, thank you. All right, we're cutting it off. Uh, this has been a great podcast. I've learned a lot from this, and uh, there's a few antennas I need to go pick up. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Any last words of wisdom, Alan, before we lock up? Have fun. Have fun. Be merry. <laughs>